Well, welcome everyone to the closing panel for the Esports Academy. You know, you heard a lot of um, various topics, and I, you know, we want to kind of give a more general overview of how esports in general has changed, kind of. Um, the gaming industry. Uh, what I'll do is I'll have our you know esteemed panelists kind of introduce themselves, their company, and maybe you know your experience of how esports has changed the industry that you are in. Yes, yeah, so we'll maybe we'll start with Patrick. Okay, um, Patrick Barthe. Uh, by day, I'm working for Atomic Infotech, where we're working with game publishers, putting on esports competitions globally. Um, uh, getting to work with the Department of Defense, uh, doing partnerships and things like that, so bringing esports to the military. And then by night, I'm an entrepreneur uh, working in the amateur esports space, um, getting to play in high school esports, collegiate esports, and, um, and various things. And how, have you, how has esports kind of, in your experience, changed the industry that you're working in? Um, I guess what we're seeing is basically if you look at from traditional sports where I kind of came from to esports today, what you're seeing is the model. Uh, everyone's kind of seeing esports as being like this this new thing, but like we have a model that exists. It's called traditional sports. So what I'm seeing is people are adopting a lot of the same strategies that you're seeing typically in traditional sports, and now you're you're seeing those things develop in in esport. That's that's how I'm seeing it. That Sure. Hi, I'm Stuart Kelp, uh, also with Atomic, and uh, we focus on live broadcast production, and one of the things that does set us apart a little bit is uh, we develop custom software for those uh, live workflows, as well as some of the other clients and the game developers that we work with. And um, one of the things that's changed with the industry, and the industry or how the industry has changed our business is... <laughs> the focus on technology and the developments in technology and how we're leveraging those different workflows uh, in our production environments. Hi, I'm David Lee um, from ESP Gaming. Um, we are also a tournament organizer. We have our own um, tournament IP called the World Showdown of Esports. Um, we are based in Las Vegas and you know we've worked very closely with uh, many mobile publishers and kind of had a big part in ushering in, um, you know, mobile esports uh, hitting the mainstream, at least in the West. Um, we were the first to put, you know, um, mobile esports on television, on CBS Sports Network, um, and, you know, we're continuing to, you know, work with various partners to um, continue to make waves in the industry. Great, man. I guess I jumped right into my presentation, so I forgot to introduce myself. Um, but my name is Ted. I'm uh, based in Vancouver, um, so I'm CEO of P um, Games, and uh, we are currently building um, your platform solutions uh, for esports, and which goes into why I talked about identifying opportunities. Um, but um, our company was actually recently acquired by um, a company called Victory Square Technologies, which is an incubator uh, up in Vancouver. Uh, and yeah, I'm glad to be with this panel today. Well, thank you. And I realize I haven't introduced myself. So my name is Yen Peng, and I'm corporate counsel for a video game developer and publisher called NCSoft. Uh, and what's interesting is, you know, the law is always reactive. It's always reacting to new technologies. And with esports, it's been so interesting because many other laws like... Uh, you know, real estate or even, you know, publishing deals, those are largely, you see the same models over and over again. But with esports, you know, there's very new streaming, IP rights, broadcast rights. Um, you know, in Japan, there's a lot of strict kind of gambling sweepstakes and consumer protection laws. And so when you have publishers there that want to have tournaments, they have to really consider how do they run these tournaments with, without running afoul um, some of those uh, existing laws. Um, and so, you know, I think from all the panelists, you know, what they do, the uh, speakers that you heard today, what I think is really interesting is esports and the video game industry is really an ecosystem. You see, you know, a huge surge and then technology coming in, uh, viewers coming in, and that in turn kind of changes the, the industry. And I think before we kind of get into some of the, the different topics that we had discussed um, on our kind of planning uh, call, I wanted to get a sense of the audience, um, you know, which, which aspect, you know, Ted had a really great uh, kind of chart of, you know, the, the, the different players and different areas of the esports and video game industry. Um, we want to get a sense, are you guys more indie developers, you know, streaming technology, um, analytics? I guess, 
maybe you guys could yell out, you know, some of the, the broad industries that you guys are in so we can kind of understand which aspects would be most helpful to you. Publishing. Publishing. Marketing. Marketing. So like user acquisition type marketing or? Advertising. Advertising. Mm. Okay, well, well, great. I think, you know, let's kind of start with, um, let's start with, you know, kind of marketing, advertising, and I think, you know, with the panelists here, there's so much about content. Um, and with eSports, I think one big difference, um, you know, that Chris at Genvid had kind of talked about too was, uh, publishers and developers have kind of shifted the focus from developing the game for the player and now for the viewers. And with, you know, with the viewers, now you have more opportunities for marketing, investments, and could, so, you know, did our panelists want to touch upon kind of how um, that viewership aspect and the technology and how that has kind of changed the video game industry? There's another mic. So. Oh. Maybe the, you know content curation. Yeah, I think um, I think the viewership uh, demographic is very unique in esports, and it um, you know obviously uh, kind of a hard to reach audience. And um, you know, gaming is a very useful way to um, reach that audience. And you know, speaking about you know advertising, for example, um, you know it's really it's it's really difficult to kind of get that messaging across when more than half of the target demographic you're looking at doesn't own a you know cable TV subscription, right? So um, I think you're finding a lot more, um, I guess, creative ways for brands to integrate into esports and events. And we're seeing that across the board. Like we've done in the past, like you know, six months, we've done you know unique, uh, you know, from scratch activations for like Progressive and you know Corn Nuts and these mainstream brands. And I think that's very uh, encouraging to see. And could you go in a little bit more detail? I think you know maybe working day in and day out with these activations, um, it comes naturally to you, but you know, could you kind of talk about how it is different for, for instance, let's say Progressive, to do advertising um, in a non-esports industry, and then you know, how they successfully kind of target the audience via esports? Yeah, I, I think it depends on um, the brand and what their objectives are. Obviously, you know, if you're you know, uh, 14 to 18 years old, and you're, you're not, owning a car or a car insurance, but, you know, it's the brand awareness that's generated from that, right? So, um, you know, people are now ingrained if you're watching, you know, uh, if you're watching esports broadcasts and you see Progressive everywhere, next time you need car insurance, when you hit, you know, 22 and you're per buying your first car, that's probably the brand that you're going to go with, right? And that's kind of like the um, philosophy that you see across different brands. You also see, um, you know, there are certain brands where they want, um, they want to sell product and they want to see, you know, how much you move the needle. So it's, I think it's a case by case basis. I'll, I'll say it in terms of working with the Department of Defense, I mean, there would not be military esports without it being underwritten by USAA. So, so you're, you're excited that, that these brands endemic or non-endemic are actually taking those risks and saying that is my demographic and, and wanting to jump in and subsidize. And it I was just going to jump in there and say one of the most attractive things about these audiences is these audiences are transcending borders in a lot of in a lot of minutes in ages as well as gender, and that's really really attractive to a, a lot of these brands trying to advertise with us. And I guess you know I, I saw on the Atomic website um, you guys have worked with you know various clients, and I'm kind of curious you know you guys have done kind of esports geared uh, events and tournaments, and as well as kind of you know more general tech. Do you see um, a difference in how how those uh, I guess experiences are set up when it's esports versus when it's you know kind of general tech industries? I think yes, there are definitely some differences, um, but more and more um, the, with our company specifically, we're finding that those things are overlapping quite a bit, and we're finding ways to take those technologies and the skill sets that we have, especially from our developers and integrate those skill sets into those events and into the projects that we're working on. And that's helped us with some of the success we've had uh, with a lot of our clients. I, I think it's, it's, it's fun to see like a, you know, an Xbox Game Studios. I think a, a lot of these publishers, they're actually wanting to subsidize again their, 
events with corporate sponsors, right? So, so now what we're seeing is, is you know, well, we don't have to shell this money out from, from our own coffers. Let's, let's, we've got the viewership. Let's, let's go and have Progressive or someone else come in there. And so seeing the, these publishers actually invite sponsors into the fray and, and make them part of the, the whole entertainment experience. And I think that is, you know, one big way that esports has kind of changed the gaming industry is that it's become uh, less kind of publisher driven and now publishers are finding ways to work with different brands, to work with uh, different investors, to really expand the entire experience, not just from, uh, you know, even if we take a, a simple kind of fighting competition, you know, when you are a player and you play in the first round and you are knocked out, you're kind of sitting around doing nothing. And I think now publishers, you know, like Blizzard, con and other cons, it, it becomes more of experience. So there's the esports component, but there's also the entire gaming experience. And because they've opened that up, so much more has now come into the gaming industry as well. Yeah, I guess it's adding to that. Um, I think the fun thing with esports is uh, it's very experimental. Uh, I think because it's so new, um, you, know, you go to an event, whether it's a uh, you know, Blizzard event, Dota, League, whatnot, uh, you know, I think each time they're trying to one-up the Knicks, right? And I think that's very cool to see. And I think it's just a matter of time when they, you know, they're able to kind of figure out how, um, from that advertising sponsorship perspective, you know, they can activate things for brands. And, and you're already more and more you're seeing it. And um, you know, one of the interesting things for me is like, you know, when you tune into, let's say, uh, a Chinese stream event, uh, you know, the way that they integrate brands with, uh, you know, KFC and with, uh, you know, some of the other ones. Um, yeah, it's just kind of you know, amazing to see. Um, but I think personally, one of the um, the problems I would say that uh, I'm trying to tackle for my business is, uh, you know, these are the big events we're talking about. Um, but what about just kind of your, um, you know, everyday viewer ex events? So, you know, for example, you know, Vancouver has an Overwatch team now. You know, we were really excited that you know we were the um, season one, I mean, season one. I don't, I don't know what you call it, but the, the, um, they they won the, the kind of first uh, cohort of the championship. Um, so I attended the finals event, but it just seemed like these guys didn't know what they were doing. Um, you know. It was like going to any sports bar. You walk in, you walk out. There was no fan engagement. They didn't really make that effort to make you feel like you, you belong, right? So uh, I feel like there is still that bit of disconnect. Uh, and um, yeah, I think it's going to be a matter of time until I mean, people, um, whether it's event organizers, um, the teams themselves, the games themselves, you know, find a better way to engage with um, the audience. And I'm curious, I know, Ted, you had helped um, organize one of the first Canadian kind of mobile events. Uh, I'm wondering, you know, with the justice position that you mentioned, you know, there wasn't much fan engagement, there wasn't much interactivity. Um, what, what do you see could increase that? And maybe when your own experience in putting on that event, what did you bring in to kind of create that experience? Yeah, I mean, for me, it's always been... Um, you know, viewer player first, right? Um, so putting myself in the shoes of someone that walks in, uh, whether it's a qualifying event or the actual tournament, um, are, are they going to come in angry because they don't know where to go? There's no seating. Um, it's it's a mess. Uh, it, the internet's bad. So uh, you know, these are kind of all, you know, a lot of things that you have to think beforehand, even um, you know, from from that first experience where someone walks in. Uh, and so, surprisingly, uh, you know, um, having organized small events and mid-sized events, um, you know, when I attend as an attendee to other events, it, it just seemed like um, a lot of times it, it was very hastily slapped together. Um, a lot of things haven't been uh, quite well prepared beforehand. And most importantly, back to my point, is uh, you know, as someone that is uh, experiences, experiencing this as a guest, I, I did not feel that I was welcomed. <laughs> Uh, and I guess switching gears a little bit, you know, we've talked about kind of all of the things that have grown from esports, like these events, uh, both live and offline. But, um, you know, I, I think one thing that we kind of talked about before that was really interesting is just how esports has changed the perception of gamers and games. You know, no longer are kind of the gamers, you know, the, the folks that are in the basement eating Cheetos, you know, living in their parents. Um, but now instead, you know, we have... Uh, Brands that want to, you know, gear towards uh, gear towards that segment. We have um, large prize pools dedicated to them. We have, you know, scholarships and varsities. And I, you know, I wanted to ask the panel, what do you think has really contributed um, to that change in perception? Is it the content? Is it the amount of money that's coming in? What has kind of legitimized esports in the in the gaming industry? 
Um, I think it's I think it's the realization that it's a legitimate revenue stream. Um, if you look at if you look at uh, larger publishers who have successfully monetized, um, like Valve, for example, a very clear example um, through the international and through Counter Strike majors and so forth. Um, <clears throat> making you know millions and millions and millions of dollars per event and you know it's their dedication and it's their commitment um, in their in a long-term strategy and esports is generally considered as a marketing tool for a user acquisition and retention right so you know now you're off you're building an entity right within your business that's going to you know generate new users and retain existing users and then it's going to be self-fulfilling and it's going to be self-sustaining um, in the future right once the product matures and I think that's the sexiest thing is that hey now I get free UA free retention right and where previously I'm paying you know eight bucks twelve bucks pop so I think that's that's one key draw for publishers. I, th I think you can look at the life cycle of the gamer. I, I keep referring back to traditional sports. You know, we can look at the NFL and we can say, hey, there's there's middle school football and there's high school football and there's collegiate. And then one day you can give up your dream of being the quarterback, but there's still going to be broadcast production and there's going to be marketing and you can be a journalist. And and we can now look at that for esports, and we can say the kid in his basement who is eating Cheetos now can now can say that hey, you know, I I can play for my high school and be part of something that's important. I can uh, go to one of 125 colleges and universities that are offering over 25 million dollars in college scholarships. You know, mom, there's there's a real scholarship available. You know, I can potentially uh, be somewhere on a platform and and if I don't become the best Dota player in the world, I can still become that graphic artist, that that aspiring Absolutely. Yeah, there are careers. Um, so speaking of collegiate and acad academia, right, um, our, uh, this year was a second year we did um, the Mountain West Esports uh, Championship, right, and the Mountain West is a mid-major sports conference with schools like Boise State, UNLV, Nevada, um, Air Force Academy, and so forth, San Jose State, just naming a few schools, right, and um, they're um, really, their commitment to esports and their exploration of the esports space was largely generated upon the fact that you know you have your student body, where a large portion of you know certain majors, specifically maybe like computer science or engineering, who may not be sports fans, right? So the school spirit aspect is a little missing there. So when those when those um, when those students end up graduating and they end up with elite jobs, because a lot of people in the esports audience end up having decent jobs and professions and careers, they have a higher propensity to now donate back to the school and they're, they themselves, uh, e the esports program itself is a massive recruiting tool too, right? So when they announced like some of the schools reported as, you know, um, I don't think it was like publicly um, published anywhere, but you know, schools were sharing, you know, you know, case studies with us saying, hey, we announced this and within, you know, um, 24 hours, we had like thousands of applicants from international countries now interested in applying to our schools because we announced this esports program, right? So I think um, that's another very interesting um, wrinkle into the mix. Yeah, I would say university kids are, you know, I mean, so university clubs uh, wise, you know, esports clubs are probably the best club to join. So one of my first hires um, is actually the founder of the UBC Esports Association. So she's the manager of the team that, um, you know, won the, um, the PAX East tournament um, twice. So when I need someone that knew esports, you know, who would I go to, right? That, the person that actually managed the esports team. Uh, and likewise, you know, the, the, the people that have taken over the club after she left, uh, you know, they're a hot commodity. Um, you know, all the Carmen Lamb? Yes, Carmen, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> She's great. Yep. <laughs> Yeah, you know, t today's topic is kind of how esports has changed the gaming industry. However, you know, like we touched upon, it hasn't just changed the gaming industry, you know, with the, the collegiate industry. And then even recently, UW has now, you know, kind of their esports arena um, that's dedicated to, you know, video game play. And so... Uh, Besides kind of the technology side, I kind of wanted to transition too into kind of the infrastructure. And I guess, you know, with infrastructure, there's not only kind of the city venues, um, collegiate venues, but, you know, thinking about actually the technology infrastructure, like having, you know, the Wi-Fi or uh, other streaming technologies, you know, all of that I think has 
really uh, spurred a lot of new technology because we have such a high demand for it. I don't know if you guys have any comments about either, you know, uh, physical venues or kind of the infrastructure. He, he battles that every day. <laughs> I think that's one of the biggest challenges we face, and I'm sure you guys can relate to that as well, um, especially as we travel all over the world. We've done things in the middle of a field for the 24 hour of the month, and we've gone to convention centers and we've gone everywhere. And it's one of the biggest struggles is trying to find the technical resources and all of the assets that you need to put one of these shows on successfully. Uh, otherwise, you find yourself really struggling with cellular bonded back, like all kinds of different solutions that you're trying to patch together to make things work for, for your clients. Um, but um, I think that's one of the most interesting things about uh, now is from city to city, you're seeing all these different venues pop up, and um, I think from a technical standpoint, that's, I mean, one of the biggest of, sorry, anything else? Sorry. I guess, what, and what opportunities do you kind of see in this area, because they're, Oh, you know, in this area specifically, I think we definitely need um, a facility. It's one of the things that we're doing as an organization. We've got a studio downtown, and we are looking for probably 20,000 to 30,000 square feet that we could, or that we could put it a dedicated arena here in Seattle. And it's definitely necessary at this point. I think the entire ecosystem benefits from new venues that pop up and you know every year you're seeing it feels like every month there's a new new announcement in a major city for a venue. Um, yeah. So I think I think that's encouraging to see. I think it's encouraging to see, you know, additional investments and more people entering the space. But you know, you know, we're it's you know Stewart's absolutely right that you need that infrastructure or else you know we're you're you're kind of creating makeshift esports at wherever you go. Mm -hmm. Thankfully, a lot of times like the basics are are there for the most part, and you could kind of figure out with rentals or your own equipment. But for the most part, it's you increase production value incredibly once you have a proper venue. But with those property venues as well, I think one of the things that come is a real cost advantage to doing those things. Um, in a lot of the different venues, it becomes cost prohibitive, especially when you're looking at, because not every single event is going to be a major. It's not going to be, you know, 10,000 people in the arena. We're really looking at venues that can house 500 to 3,000 people at a time and support a lot of these publishers or even just the local tournaments that don't have the budgets that these other publishers do, right? So before we, we open it up to questions, because I, I, I do want to do that, I guess I wanted to touch upon maybe just two more things. One is, you know, kind of influencers, and then one is kind of from the publisher's perspective. So we kind of talked about, um, you know, the different resources that are available to publishers, regardless of, you you know, you want to do more uh, content engagement, you want to do live events. I guess from a game design aspect, um, what are some, you know, features that you think developers and publishers need to start thinking about, you know, for instance, like spectate mode or PVP? Uh, I know we kind of, you know, went through a couple, but could you guys elaborate a little bit more? Yeah, I guess I can start a little bit with that. Um, you know, before concentrating on building a platform, uh, I was actually working on several mobile games. Um, so those of you that have seen my previous talks for Pocket Gamer, uh, I was previ previously building out um, mobile content um, from the media side, and also actually uh, working on some mobile games with uh, you know esports component to it. So uh, you know, but having gone through that, I realized there's challenges. Uh, it's not so much about you know adding one or two features and slapping on economy of esports, right? I think you know Chopper was saying earlier, um, you know, it, it's you know, you can, it's not a good approach to build something and uh, call it an esports, um, you know, uh, right from the get go. Um, but you know, while saying that, you know, Yan, as you mentioned, you know, spectator mode is obviously very important. Um, you know, custom matchmaking, uh, and I think the most important thing that people neglect is that, that fair, fair, uh, fair balancing. Uh, and this is a big reason why I feel mobile esports hasn't quite taken off yet, at least in the West. Uh, is, is that a lot of times, um, you know, when you look at the most successful games on mobile, you know, they're free-to-play games um, built with a monetization curve that you know goes up like this, right? Um, so. With Clash Royale, uh, it wasn't built as an esports game, and so by the time when they felt that okay, you know what, people want to compete, let's um, make it an esports game by capping off the competitive level at this, um, it, it created a lot of confusion, right? Um, so, um, yeah, <laughs> it wasn't a very straightforward answer, but you, you you make a great point though that the publishers themselves that even have had a little success, they didn't intend on planning to build an esport, or the publisher is now trying to go create their you know, title into an esport. Um, the 
from just walking the hall out here and, and seeing the games, the the interesting point that I took was that, that like these aren't multiplayer games and yet for esports that's kind of necessary. And and so like the if if I had a reaction here it was that no one had a knee jerk reaction to somehow needing to build the next esport, so to speak, because because you can't necessarily just go do that, right? As you were as you were alluding to. Uh, yeah, I think it's I think it's very uh, interesting to see how developers, especially those that, that are successful, both you know, um, like rolling out successful game titles as well as successful mobile esports titles, um, how they're learning from their previous um, you know uh, experiences, right? So, like one example is like Supercell, right? Um, they they didn't expect Clash Royale to you know explode in pop popularity like that, especially on a competitive standpoint, right? And um, when the game was first released, um, or and several years after, you didn't you saw you know you saw no ability to um, uh, to face somebody unless you left your clan and joined a custom clan and then you you then you play a friendly match against each other and that's what i see like even now like you see like you know fifa mobile for example uh, like that's a game where with massive player base no ability to play each other right so so clash royale then built that feature in and then their next game release which was brawl stars they were like oh, you know what we're going to include this from the get go just in case we have to go back and fix it right so i think i think seeing that kind of like Astute and sharp, you know, um, thinking and credit like, and planning. I think um, that's encouraging to see. Can can a prize pool be a feature? <laughs> Cla Clash Royale, million dollars. That's a feature. Uh, that that gets some customers. And I guess that, so. The last one I want to touch on was the kind of influencer. So again, you know, when you have an esports and you have people playing at the top of their game, you know, now we have a lot of streaming, a lot of tutorials, and you know, kind of Stuart mentioned, it's it's sometimes it's this give and take. You influence the gaming industry, but it you you know influence back. And now we, I think, in the gaming industry, we've seen more utilization of influencers than ever before. I want to ask, you know, is there a um, efficient or smart way to kind of utilize influencers if you're in esports or just a general uh, video game? One of the things that I'm seeing most right now is a lot of publishers or different game titles, they're just leveraging the audiences of those influencers, but more so I'm seeing with each project that we, that we work on is, are these influencers are now becoming the broadcasters and they are starting to own that and I think that's going to happen more and more as we move forward for sure. All right, we have time for questions. Anyone have any questions? I think we answered everything. <laughs> <laughs> All right, as the ending then, I would like, oh. oh. I guess, um, so you guys mentioned like the value of like uh, esports in college and like the, the various different paths you can approach to become relevant to like the value of an esports club. Um, is there a clear way really to progress through that? Like. This is very open-ended right now that like, you obviously have to network in the esports industry to uh, get to most places. So where's your transition from like a college university and like a clear path, path to pro, I guess? Um, yeah, I guess I could tackle that because I, I hired a few esports guys. Um, I think location obviously has a lot to do with it. Um, so um, it helps that you know if you're based in LA or you're based in uh, you know but even in Seattle, I think you know, there's a lot of companies with that need for uh, people that understand the esports ecosystem. Um, but you know even at the club level, right? I mean um, you know way back in the days when I, I was um, part of university clubs, I and mean, one of the things that you always do is you look for you know sponsors and partnerships, and, and that's always a good start. Um, and so with esports, um, you know, you're in a very easy position to go out and reach the, you know, the Acers, the Razors, the uh, Turtle Beaches for, um, you know, like free free swag and free mouses and whatnot, and building that connection. Uh, so it's not even about networking. It's about I have a business proposition, uh, even though I'm still a student at this club. Would you like to do something? Or if ESP and Tomix having an event. Um, there, you guys are looking for volunteers, perfect time, um, you know, uh, get to the students, you guys need to promote your event. Uh, so there's a lot of value add, I think, students and student clubs can offer to the businesses, actually. But are you also referring to, like, like I'm going to college at USC because I want to become a professional gamer as well, not just in a career? Um, I was more along that lines, but I definitely do see the value, like, working with a lot of players. How do, how do they scale when, like, university is not necessary at all for uh, esports players. 
It's a great question. <laughs> I don't think there is a, a clear cut answer for that right now. Um, I mean, I think you, by the very nature of being very good at what you do, you are seen. You are going to these these top tier events and, and you're succeeding. I don't think we, we ne naturally see that path today. I don't know if you guys have any responses. Nope. Yeah, my experience from collegiate and pro is that they they are actually kind of two separate groups. Unlike traditional sports, where kind of the collegiate, you know, the high school feeds into the collegiate, feeds into the pro. I don't really, I haven't really seen that kind of in esports, just because it is such a young age. Um, you know, there are. I think in the beginning there were a couple instances like at raw. Uh, RMU where a student plays, they're fantastic, and then a team comes and swoops them up. But I think more for the collegiate players, it is an area where they can have that, you know, kind of um, school spirit where they can represent their team and they know they can't probably compete at that top level, but they can still participate in the things that they love. Yeah, and on that topic, um, you know, sharing an interesting story on the, on the note of the VC team, uh, and it, it's kind of um, conflicting in that, you know, if you're attending a good school, you don't really have time for games. And as you know, being a professional gamer requires a lot of practice and a lot of effort. And so the two-time um, you know, collegiate champions um, actually faced um, um, you know, a big problem because two of their guys was on the verge of failing uh, the engineering um, degree that they were on, on the path to do. So um, yeah, they, um, because unlike um, you know, NCAA, where um, you know, the, the top basketball players are kind of, you know, you know they're known that you know, you're going to be busy with basketball, so we're going to put you into easiest classes, and academics not the most important thing. A lot of times, honestly, gamers are, you know, like, not to say basketball guys, not smart, but gamers are very smart, educated people that are pursuing a very proper college degree. So um, you know, it, it's kind of conflicting that you're spending all this time in school, and you actually have to still compete on a professional level. Yeah, just to add to that, I think the, the path to pro is more about educating uh, the general like student body about the opportunities that exist in the esports industry. It's not it's not about professional gaming because you know the reason why collegiate uh, athletics is so uh, is so popular and it, and it thrives is frankly because all the professional leagues have age limitations on them and you can't compete as a pro, right? So you're forced to compete at a high level and that highest level in America is NCAA, right? And so that's the only platform that you could showcase your skills. Here, it's like the second you hit the age 16, depends on the game, but the second you hit the age 16, you're signing a major contract with a, with a major esports organization. So there's absolutely no, no need to um, focus on collegiate athletics. But I think as, the, as this ecosystem matures a little more, I think you're going to see a lot more structure and so forth and, and uh, a much more elevated um, overall skill level. Well, I want to thank Ted, David, Stewart, and Patrick again. You know, this, this topic, I'm sure we could go on and on, and I think all of us are here for a little bit more. So if you guys have any more questions, want to hear, you know, pick their brain about how esports will change the gaming industry in the next three to five years, you know, we have all that prepared, and we'd love to tell you more about it. Thank you so much. Thank you.